Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Doctor is in podcast and our special series, What Plants Crave. I'm your host, Dr. Nadia Saba, president of Dr. Greenhouse. My guest today is Ian Baker, Greenhouse Manager of Join Bio, which is a research-based company that is studying the use of microbes to reduce our reliance on nitrogen fertilizers for the production of corn and soy. He also did a stint at Plenty, which is one of the most well-funded vertical farming ventures in the world with the aim of reshaping agriculture. Speaking of reshaping agriculture, Ian is also, I hope, going to talk to us a little bit about the art of bonsai. It's a good segue, right? That was great. <laughs> Hi, Ian. It's so great to have you on What Plants uh, Crave. I'm super excited to learn more about greenhouses and how they're used for research and the advancement of crop science um, and how that might compare to other CEA operations that are more focused on, you know, the actual production of growing food, flowers, medicine, et cetera, for consumption. Welcome. Yeah, no, that's great. I can't wait to get into it. Thanks, Nadia. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm really excited to do this. So awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, first up, what got you interested in horticulture and greenhouses and what you're working on now? Oh, it goes way back. Um, I have to say, I think growing up and being in gardens, like in, in my hometown, there were there were older folks that had these victory gardens, just gorgeously maintained uh spaces that you know were had an aesthetic quality but where they grow food and it's a part of sort of survival and it comes from that whole victory garden um heritage like some of my best memories are uh, as a kid running around in in these sort of edens so i've always been turned on by that and gardening has always been a thing that's happened with my my mom and other family members at home. But, you know, I've also been really interested in just systems and I'm perpetually fascinated by how things work. So I actually didn't go to school right away. I went out and worked and I always knew I was going to go back and finish my degree. And so I decided to go see UC Davis because I was really interested in sustainable agriculture. And a big driver for that is that I'm really interested in food, culture, and just our relationship with food and where that comes from. So I had this romantic idea that I was going to go to UC Davis and become a farmer. Um, Well, I learned a lot. And one of the first things I learned was that, you know, when you're a legit farmer out there in the field, you you don't make a lot of money and you work your butt off. And... um, you know, there's a lot of unpredictable things out there that you have to deal with. And so this sort of idea of just jumping in and being a traditional farmer right away kind of waned a little bit. You know, I, I was working at the Botanical Conservatory and um, that's a lot of fun because there's a, just a big greenhouse wonderland full of different species of plants that get maintained for teaching and aesthetic purposes. And I happened to be at the right place at the right time when a position opened up as a greenhouse manager um, for the College of Biological Sciences. So, you know, I got hired into that because of what I demonstrated working in the conservatory. And I basically cut my teeth on greenhouse management uh, in the research greenhouses. That was a lot of fun because I was supporting you know, some traditional botany work, but a lot of ecology as well. So I had greenhouses that had, you know, traditional crops and tomatoes, but then one had streptanthus in it, which is just a beautiful flower that grows in serpentine soils. Um, Gongora orchids, where they were studying uh, scent interactions with pollinators at a vanilla greenhouse. That was a lot of fun. A greenhouse full of different weeds for the weed science group, um, all, you know, herbicide resistant, absolute pain in the butt to manage. So, so I cut my teeth there and learned the basics of greenhouse horticulture and the sort of logistics of managing processes and people in the greenhouse. Can, can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. You said, what is a serpentine soil? So serpentine is a specific mineral and... 
serpentine soils are, are, are high in, in serpentine, obviously, but they tend to have accumulation of heavy metals and they're really low in organic matter. So there's like cobalt and nickel in them. And so streptanthus is actually adapted to growing with high levels of nickel, which is why it's being studied. So it's, it's super interesting. I'm really into geology too. Is it actually an accumulator of the nickel or does it just kind of find its way through and just leaves the nickel behind? It's a good question. I don't know the actual mechanics of it, but I, I would guess it's a function of there just being higher amounts because of the minerals versus accumulating. Okay. Uh, here's my other question. Yeah. What's a conservatory? <laughs> you know, I think of like a traditional 19th century British glass house with ornate wrought iron metalwork and, you know, Victorian people prancing about. But <laughs> their parasols, maybe? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, it's a collection of plants that's grown for the sake of genetic diversity and, and teaching purposes. So at UC Davis, you know, it's a it's a lovely place to visit, you know, as an outsider to go see a bunch of plants in a representative climate from where they came from. You know, so there'll be like a a cool arid room to represent, you know, high elevation desert or subtropical or tropical, but it's all about having a, a high degree of diversity of plants and in one space. Is that open to the public? Oh yeah. Go visit it. That's the plug for the conservatory. If you haven't been there, go visit. I'm ashamed as a, a UC Davis alum that I've never been there. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah, so so when I left the conservatory, I went from that to, you know, I had cool stuff in my greenhouses, but it was a, a little bit less exciting growing tomatoes and, you know, soybeans in the greenhouse, but still fun. So the thing that, you know, going back to my, my story, the thing that really triggered this for me was going to Panama in 2017, International Congress for Controlled Environment Agriculture. I didn't really know what I was getting into when I signed up for that. But I was like, hey, I'm going to Panama. The university is paying for it. Sign me up. And um, that's what really opened my eyes to this industry. Um, Dr. Kosai's keynote, you know, I didn't know he, who he was before I saw him speak. That's where I saw you speak for the first time, Nadia. And that really just opened my eyes to the whole scene and also the network of people that's, that's making this all happen. What was UC Davis's interest in sending you there in, in that particular conference? Uh, you know, there there wasn't uh, much much input in that sense. I mean, I, I had the budget to do it and and nobody said no. So, but I mean, it's obviously about going in and learning, you know, the, the technical ins and outs of operating a greenhouse or controlled environment space and what's the cutting edge of technology and knowing your vendors and all the basic sort of uh, value that comes from conferencing. Oh, yeah, totally. I spoke at, at that one in Panama and then uh, the, the first one in 2015. And um, very interesting group of people, very, very expert level group of, of people. You, you mentioned Dr. Kozai, but a lot of sort of international experts in CEA um, were recruited to to speak at at that congress. It was it was pretty cool um, and very humid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So okay. So fast forward to what you're doing now. What is Join Bio doing, and and how do you fit into their puzzle? Yeah. So Join Bio is a joint venture uh, initially funded by Bayer Crop Sciences, or or more specifically Leaps by Bayer, which is a a VC quote unquote arm of the bigger organization and Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, Ginkgo is based out of Boston and they're a leader in synthetic biology. So what we do at JOIN is we are basically developing engineering microbes for agricultural applications. So aside from the money from our parent companies, we get certain assets, you know, from Bayer who acquired Monsanto, they have a massive inventory of, of strains, microbial genetics. And then, you know, Ginkgo has this high throughput engineering platform for microbes. And so 
you know, Ginkgo does other stuff. They develop high value molecules, like say for a perfume or they actually were in the news recently for making a microbe that um, excretes like a, a cannabinoid, which is interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Our listeners are going to be curious about where that's going. Yeah, no, I am. I am too. <laughs> I am too. You know, so so we take the the value that comes from each of our parents, and we basically engineer microbes to solve problems in agriculture. And basically, it's like anything that you can do with a conventional chemical or fertilizer, or pesticide. We're more or less trying to figure out how to make microbes do those same things. So these microbes that you're working with, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the characteristics that you're looking for is nitrogen fixation, right? Yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah. So our, our marquee project is we're developing a nitrogen fixing microbe and it's specifically for corn cropping system. And when I say corn cropping, I mean, large scale corn growth in the Midwest of the United States or possibly in, in Brazil is our target market. And basically using a nitrogen based fertilizer is, is cheap and farmers kind of use it as insurance, you know, to put it another way, they're not incentivized to not apply a lot of nitrogen because it's not expensive to do and it ensures they're going to have a high yield. I mean, and wasn't so, that also part of the agricultural revolution? Well, Is exactly. It, yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, hybrid varieties and the Haber-Bosch process combined together is what has has created the world we live in today. And none of none of this uh, large scale food production would be possible without that. But the problem is, especially if you're talking about nitrate, it's super mobile in the soil. And if you apply too much of it, it's going to run off and um, you know, here in the Central Valley, we have issues with the groundwater and nitrate pollution. In fact, it's really interesting. I, I send water samples to the lab uh, throughout the year and you can see the spike in nitrate in the groundwater up to like 30 parts per million the first day in the fall that it rains, like literally on the data, you can see it right there. But, you know, there are other bigger, well, Maybe they're not bigger, but there are other issues when you when you have nitrogen running off, say, into the Mississippi River, it's going to go into the Gulf of Mexico and you have what's called basically eutrophication, which is the result of algae growing from the excess nitrogen and the algae grows, uses up the nitrogen, it dies off and it and it sort of rots anaerobically and causes a deficiency of oxygen in the water and it kills off a bunch of organisms that live there. Um, so these dead zones happen as a result of wow. excess nitrogen pollution. Wow. But I mean, you, you don't even have to, you know, it's these big scale things that are a problem, but you can drive out between Davis and Woodland and look in the creeks, you know, and, and see the effect of excess nitrogen applied. So it's, it's not just about these big scale problems. It's about how they manifest, you know, at various scales all over the place. So our objective with the nitrogen fixing microbe is to take, to, to engineer a microbe that works with corn, that takes triple bonded atmospheric nitrogen and it converts it to a nitrate form in order to replace 30% of the nitrogen for the corn cropping system. So, when you think about the scale, you know, the size of corn farming in the United States, 30% nitrogen is a lot. It's a ton. Is that, what is that 30% based on though? I mean, if you said that growers, it's, it's cheap and easy and maybe even habitual to apply mm -hmm. all this nitrate. I mean, is, is there a baseline or how do you calculate a 30% if growers can or farmers can just add however much they want? Yeah, yeah. I would say this is getting a little bit out of my wheelhouse, but a lot of it has to do with the constraints, the technical constraints of what we're trying to do with the microbes, you know, and, and how much you can basically engineer this trade into a microbe and how persistent the microbe can be. 
against all the other traits that you're trying to, to sort of manage this early in the, the R&D process. So there's a lot of factors that go into that number around technical constraints and economic viability of, you know, will a farmer want to buy this product in the first place? What number do we have to meet in order for it to be a desirable product and all that sort of stuff? So that's the sweet spot we arrived at. Are the microbes kind of applied like at the root level? Are, are they trying to kind of create like a symbi? Are you hoping that they would create a symbiotic relationship with the corn or soy plant? Yeah, I mean that's that's part of the the consideration because when you're when you're engineering a microbe, you you have a what we call a chassis organism organism, and that's usually some sort of wild type strain that has certain um, colon colonizing characteristics. And then we're taking the trait, the nitrogen fixing trait or traits and putting them in the chassis organism. And part of that <clears throat> consideration, again, it's complex, but part of that consideration is, does the microbe colonize through what mechanism, what plant tissue via what application method? Um, how persistent is it? Because you know you want it to colonize the plant, but say you don't want it to be persistent in the soil year after year for you know perhaps regulatory reasons or perhaps the viability of the product like if you if you put a microbe in in the soil and it stays there year after year why would the farmer need to come back and buy more of it necessarily but so so the ideal method for us though is to be able to have a seed treatment um you know so a lot of commercial corn or soy seeds have various um, seed treatment packages with chemical fungicides and biologicals applied to them because it's it costs money to go out and spray a field, right? And it's a lot of labor as well. So if you can apply the microbe to the seed, have it colonize the tissue as the plant grows, that's, the, that's what we're trying to get to. That's super interesting. So it's already sort of a packet of food that the plant starts with um, exactly. from its seed. Okay. Exactly. One of the I have to ask, I mean, how do you rein in these microbes? I mean, I, when I think about microorganisms in general, they tend to replicate, pre-produce very quickly. Uh -huh. Is it a challenge to prevent them from mutating or evolving out of the characteristics you are trying to engineer in them? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and again, this is not, I'm not a microbiologist, but I mean, you, you're hitting the nail on the head with some of the technical challenges we, we're facing and in, in making this happen. Nature prevails. I mean, we, nature we've seen- Nature finds a way. That, that's, that's exactly it. Nature finds a way. Like we've had issues with microbes basically doing what they want, where we, we put traits in them and then the next generation, you know, they, they revert back and- that is just part of the complex pipeline of engineering these microbes and finding or, or creating some level of stability and getting to a marketable product. And it and it's it's not easy. It's an extremely difficult problem to solve. Well, I think it's valiant um, to try to find alternative ways to fertilize these plants, this large production agriculture, and wean ourselves away from chemical fertilizers. You know, in, in the time of this Russian-Ukraine war, we know a majority of those fertilizers come from that region of the world. And we know that farmers are really struggling with the increased prices and supply challenges associated with even procuring those fertilizers. So it's one thing, yeah, this we're helping with the environment, but we could also potentially help make our agricultural system more resilient um, yeah. in the face of external challenges even. Yeah. I mean, geopolitical, but also, you know, there's a primary effect of over applying nitrogen fertilizer, but I mean, let's not lose sight of the fact that the Haber-Bosch process is extremely energy intensive as well. And we, we have to use, you know, petroleum products to create these fertilizers in the first place. So yeah. there, it's a multifaceted problem. Good call. I have to ask, because I'm a huge fan of uh, George Washington Carver, why aren't we just rotating these crops with legumes and sweet potatoes? That's that's the question. And, and, you know, 
again, these are extremely complex challenges to solve. And I've seen this over and over again, especially in my sort of process in school, going from romanticized ideas to reality. And you can do things like that at a smaller scale, but it doesn't work under certain contexts and it doesn't work at certain scales. And, I, and I'm by no means saying that, you know, sustainable practices shouldn't be pursued, but we just have to be realistic about the fact that there are drawbacks or difficulties to actually executing these things at scale. You know, it's one thing for somebody running a, a small organic farm to do crop rotation and to have a, a, a leguminous crop and, and to rotate that through. But, you know, you look at a 10,000 acre corn farm in, in Iowa or something, what's the incentive for the farmer to do that? If nitrogen's cheap and there's no regulation that's forcing them otherwise, they have no incentive to do that. I mean, it's ironic, isn't it? It's because the agricultural revolution and this readily available source of nitrates is what allowed for big production agriculture yep. in the first place. Yeah, um, yeah. Otherwise, we probably would still be applying um, the methods of rotating crops um, that Carver gave as a very practical solution to sort of healing the soils and bringing nitrogen back to the soil in between the other crops like cotton, right, um, in those same fields. So here we are, we went from small to large and what's the future? What do you think the future is? I'm gonna ask you that future, the future question at the beginning of the conversation. I mean, yeah. does, I, and, I mean, you've been in sustainable ag and international ag development. I, I'm kind of actually kind of curious about your thoughts on, you know, there's practices we apply here in the US I would love to ask you questions about Brazil. My sister lives in Brazil, so I want to know why that's a target spot. I guess thinking in the in the in the global context of these solutions and small versus large farms. I mean, in the rest of the world, and by the rest of the world, maybe it's eighty percent of the rest of the world, and there's still twenty percent, right? I don't know what the number is. What is the distribution of small versus large production agriculture? You know, I, I have no idea, but. I think it's interesting to consider, again, you know, coming back from these romantic ideas, we, we look at agriculture and farming with this with this very rosy lens that, of this pastoral small farm that's diversified with a red barn and green grass. And there's the always is, a red barn. <laughs> there's always a red barn. It's because, you know, you wouldn't buy the butter if it had a picture of a cattle operation on the front of it that, you know, the way it actually looks, right? As opposed to Bessie with like her bell. Exactly. Her neck. Yeah, exactly. You, <laughs> you know exactly where they are if you're a dairy it, farmer. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, the thing is, you have to be careful about applying a, an overly simplified value judgment to one thing or another this is good, this is bad, you know, big, bad, small, good. Because when you think about it, agriculture is one of our biggest, or is it the biggest use of land in the world? And if, if all we did was run small scale farms and there was not large scale, I, I hate to use the word industrial because it's so sort of loaded, but more mechanized technology-based farming, we would not have the same scale of food production that we do currently. And we would be cutting down more forests and we'd be using water and chemicals and inputs less efficiently. And that, that romanticized idea is just not viable across the board. Now on the flip side of that, you know, you have to ask, what are we, what are we using the outputs of these large scale farms for? Like, are we growing, corn to convert it to biofuels is that a good idea you know that's kind of up in the air or making high fructose corn syrup or you know is it going into overly processed food that's making people sick versus you know wholesome nutritious food and again you have to be careful what's about applying these overly simplified value judgments. But I think that large scale farming does have a place in the world. I think that there are there are aspects of it that need to be seriously considered, but we need um, 
we need the efficiencies gained by large scale farming to continue to feed the world. And with the appropriate application of technology, we can make it more sustainable. I think the ongoing conversation about, you know, where the incentives are and what people are buying and what options people have to buy, that whole conversation is up in the air. And, you know, it, 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 it's complicated, geez. But on the flip side of that, you know, more people getting involved in small scale farming has its place too. And so going back to your question of what's the future look like, including indoor agriculture, greenhouse, controlled environment, indoor, it's a complex problem that requires a complex solutions that are suited to the context of each problem. There's no one size fits all. It's all going to have to fit within the individual context of each location and then all the other factors that go into it. I mean, just to play devil's advocate, you know, you went from large scale and you're like, oh, industrial ag is loaded. So I'm going to say mechanized. Aren't greenhouses and indoor farms a mechanized industrial agricultural venture? Exactly. Well, exactly. And, and there are, there's a whole massive complex gradient of how greenhouses are used too. I think that it takes work to be more efficient. It, it just takes more work and it's not going to be just a, a matter of slapping technology on it. We have to be critical of how we're using these systems. And, you know, we need more comprehensive life cycle analyses of all the inputs of these systems so that we can actually have data driven operations, but also not just have marketing departments running around claiming that, you know, indoor grows use 1% the amount of water of fuel agriculture. And it's like, okay, if you take into consideration, like all the water that is used throughout the system or what gets wasted when a pipe breaks or all the things that can go wrong, you know, so, you draw the boundary, right? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So you mentioned a moment ago about all the different ways that we could use greenhouses or indoor agriculture. I did want you to touch a little bit about why you're using a greenhouse um, to do this research on the microbes. Um, you know, most of the people I do talk to are producing, you know, a crop for direct consumption. You're not mm -hmm. doing that. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm hoping you can speak to um, the value of that in terms of crop science in general. Yeah. Absolutely. What it comes down to is that there, you know, this is basically a stage gate process where, where we're basically engineering these microbes and we are trying to get as predictive of possible as far upstream in the process of what the microbe is going to actually do, you know, and that starts with in vitro assays in the lab. Um, and then it moves into implanta assays in a growth chamber or in the greenhouse. And then it moves to in field assays, implanta in field assays. And the further along you get in that process, the more sort of time and money and energy intensive it is to run an assay. And when you're developing microbes like this, it's, it's, it's a numbers game. I mean, there are millions of permutations of different traits you can put in different chassis organisms. And it's just simply not feasible to take candidate, you know, candidate microbes and put them straight into the field. I mean, field trials are so labor intensive um, just to organize, let alone to execute. And so the, the, real, the, the golden egg that everybody wants to get to in, in sort of this field in plant science research is to have highly predictive assays upstream of performance in the field downstream. So if we can run an in vitro assay on a 96 well plate and know that our organism is going to fix nitrogen and work in corn in the field downstream, like that would be great, but it doesn't necessarily work that way. So, you know, you have this stage gate process where your candidates check out on that 96 well plate. Some of them do some percentage of them, and then they move downstream. And the ones that go through the greenhouse, if, if 
you know, some percentage of those perform well, then they'll move out into the field. So it's, it's about throughput and efficiency primarily. Why not and, just go from the growth chamber to the field? Why, why is there even that interim step? Like, what are you testing in that interim step? Well, we have to, the, part of that whole equation is having conditions that are indicative of what the organism and the plant will experience in the field. Because you, you want to develop a product that's going to work in the environment, and the environment's a messy place. The growth chamber, you set your day and your night temperature, and it stays those two temperatures, you know, forever. Um, so you, you need to, to have this sort of in-between environment that you can, you know, basically try to replicate field conditions in um, in a more efficient way. And then the other piece of it is it allows us to test throughout the year. And so, you know, we're running day length sensitive plants um, and in the greenhouse, you know, with supplemental lighting and heat and everything, you basically can replicate more or less field conditions of our sort of target field site throughout the year. Nice. People might not realize how many greenhouses there are scattered all over California, the country, the world, doing these sort of interim assays. Um, I can tell you that, you know, in the places that I've traveled, I've seen research greenhouses and not not gone to visit them, just driving down the highway yeah. uh, in general, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Mexico, in Germany, in Japan. Um, and, and I would encourage any of my listeners, wherever you're traveling, you know, just look up from your phone if you're not the driver and, <laughs> and look out at the fields um, and it might look boring, but you might see a greenhouse out in a direction. And a lot of times they'll have a sign that says something like bear. And you'll know that that's a research greenhouse, not a production ag greenhouse. Um, yeah. So keep your eyes peeled because they are all over the place. Absolutely. You know, and you're obviously not going to get invited into a bear greenhouse without, you know, knowing somebody. But I would love to see this whole industry, particularly CEA, open up more and, and get better at public outreach. And so people can come in, especially young people where it counts the most and see what's happening behind the scenes and, and spark some interest there. You know, I know some people are doing that, but it's still such a closed off industry and it's unfortunate. We need more farmers. Yeah. I mean, even if we have more indoor farms um, that are highly mechani mechanized and automated, we still need people to be interested and excited about growing food and maybe their skill set, you know, shifts yeah. Um, but we still need those people to keep their eyes on the plants. We still need people with green thumbs. We, you know, and we, we need people who can analyze data and, 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 and do, I mean, farmers do so much. I mean, they, they first have to start as like the psychic, right? Like what, what are people going to want next yeah. year? in yep. 10 years right like it takes cherry trees like five to ten years to produce something so like literally they're like trying to predict the future of what consumers are gonna want um you know they start there and then they have to understand soil science and water science and plant science and then they have to be good you know with their finances and and economists and <laughs> analyze data to know what worked and what didn't work i mean and they a lot of times are fixing shit on the farm. So they're exactly. all mechanics and engineers. I mean, they do it all. And even if we go into CEA, I would still expect most people are going to need to be able to do it all. I mean, maybe not do it all because there's a team, right? But still kind of the same, same. You have to wear yeah. a million hats if you're a farmer, indoor no, I, or outdoor. I completely agree, you know, and, and there's a certain kind of person that that is good at doing a lot of different things, but there's a lot of space for people to come in and specialize in these different things. And it takes a great leader to to be able to find those people and bring them in and to motivate them and, and all that. And that's a whole other thing. They have to be great leaders too. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. 
you know, so again, if we can do a better job of turning young people onto this, um, it's only going to benefit everybody. So, you know, kind of switching gears a tiny bit, like, and, and, you know, your experience of working in an indoor setting where the sun is excluded <laughs> from growing plants and, and we're relying on electrical lighting. Um, you know, one of the questions I almost want to ask is why not do that for crop science? I feel like I already know the answer. Um, but, you know, what are some of the differences or how do they compare what you're doing in a greenhouse? And I know it's completely different what your goals are, um, but in terms of just the environment, in terms of the systems you use, like how, how do you compare the greenhouse to an indoor farm? Well, you, you mean like a, a production oriented indoor, indoor farm? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the objectives are are completely different, and and frankly, most of the time, it's it's bizarro world. It's upside down because, you know, we're we're growing a plant uh, to test a microbon. So the output is not produce; it's data. Um, that's my main product, and throughput's the name of the game. So the quicker we can get produce data that tells us what we want to see the better. So my crop cycle in a typical assay is, uh, you know, two to eight weeks. The infrastructure, say for the nitrogen fixation program, you know, has extremely complicated irrigation because I'm trying to, I'm not trying, I am delivering multiple fertilizer solutions with different levels of nitrogen to every single bench in my greenhouse. You know, so that's four irrigation valves per bench delivering a different solution that that run at the same time and often an assay is 200 plants um, so that you know takes up two benches so one cohort of plants is run, growing for you know up to two months and in a greenhouse of 29 benches you know that's tens of different assays different cohorts of plants oftentimes different crops with different objectives. And I'm trying to manage all of this under one roof. And so there's this game of, you know, trying to provide the best average of conditions for everybody um, without really being able to optimize it for like, okay, I'm growing one cohort of plants and we're growing it to yield for production. Our objective is super straightforward and we have very clear KPIs of what we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, and that's that's the nitrogen fixation program. When you're talking about plant pathology, it gets even weirder because you're trying to maintain climate conditions that are conducive for the pathogen, which is the opposite of what you want for healthy plants. You know, high humidities and low light and low temperatures. And it's like, yeah, the pythium took. That's great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to kill the plant? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so, I, you know, I bet some of our growers kind of think that, that wouldn't that be nice if I could just like do anything and it would be okay if I killed this plant or unoptimized this plant or, or created, right, some sort of conditions that could potentially weaken it. Because I would say that there is probably a serendipitous moment in the killing of the attempt of killing a plant is that you might learn something that actually promotes its survival, promotes its growth, promotes some KPI that you are trying to achieve that you otherwise wouldn't have found because you're trying to do the same thing all the time. Yeah, I mean, plants are resilient, you know, like, like you said, nature finds a way and obviously you don't have to water a plant to kill it and that's easy. But at the same time that I'm trying to meet these scientific objectives, I'm trying to keep the plants as healthy as possible given the circumstances. So there's this tension between the two that I have to walk and, and it can be hard. You know, thinking about plenty um, and other vertical farms growing lettuce in a completely controlled environment, talking about like a plant being resilient, you know, thinking about, you know, kind of these real world conditions. I mean, why not just grow this lettuce in a greenhouse? 
or, or right. any plant in a greenhouse? I mean, are there efficiencies, do you think, um, of growing in indoor farms? Is, is that the future? Uh, that's the, again, that's the big question. And I certainly don't have, you know, some magical answer to that, but what is plenty doing that, that is, that makes it that much more sense to grow plants or lettuce the way they are, where they are. And a lot of people are growing lettuce in greenhouses. I mean, I, I think the thing that a lot of these indoor advocates lose sight of is the amount of technology that's used in the field. You know, you go down to Salinas and you look at the way lettuce is grown. It's, it's pretty automated and it's pretty impressive the way things are happening down there. And I think we need to, to not lose sight of that. You know, I think the big argument with growing leafy greens is the locality aspect. And if you can develop systems that grow plants well and are efficient on their inputs, and that's a big caveat because it's not easy to do that and people are still trying to break through, you know, then you'll have local lettuce and, and that's fantastic. And I, I think that there's that has its niche in this entire, you know, food system conversation that we're having. But it doesn't, I mean, you go to Walmart here in, in Sacramento in California and there's, they're driving lettuce up from Northern Mexico. And where are the economic incentives that are making this happen? Um, so I think that we do need to continue to, to work on that local aspect, but I don't think that there's, it, it just depends, you know, it makes sense to grow in a greenhouse in an area where there's space, land cost is an issue. Um, but when there's sun, like, let's take advantage of that sun energy versus growing it entirely indoors. But if we're building a system to grow lettuce in San Francisco, you know, then it makes sense to be indoors. Um, so it's really context specific. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of locations around the world where, I mean, you just simply couldn't grow anything outdoors, um, let alone lettuce. Um, yeah. If you're in any sort of extreme climate, um, never have access to sun or only have access to sun, you know, certain times of the year and not yeah. other times of the year, if you're in Alaska or Northern Canada or, I don't know, Antarctica, right? I was going mean, to say, I lose sight of that being a California boy. <laughs> I know, we're so spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> You're the right person to ask this question. Why not grow soy and corn in a greenhouse or an indoor farm? I mean, could, could that ever happen? What would it take for that to happen? Or what would motivate that? Growing cereal crops in a greenhouse doesn't pay off economically for the cost of the space and the cost of the energy inputs for the amount of, of yield that you're getting you know, on the on the global sort of cereal crop market, it, it, the economics just don't make sense. While we have the ability to grow soy or corn out in the field, you know, the way we do currently. Now, if that formula changes in the future, maybe we do need to look at this. But you know, for the the amount of yield you're getting per square footage, it's it's it doesn't make sense economically. It's not a high enough value crop. I mean, when I think about cornfields, it seems like those corn plants are already spaced pretty close together. Mm -hmm. So making the argument that you could increase crop density in a greenhouse doesn't seem like that one would hold water. No, so you have to be some other efficiency other than maybe land use. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's containing those microbes. Yeah, again, it's all context specific and there yeah. might be there might be circumstances under which that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going back to, to greenhouses, you have had the pleasure, if I can call it the pleasure. Have I? <laughs> the pleasure or the pain or both um, of both retrofitting an existing greenhouse and directing, you know, the, um, the design and build of a new greenhouse. I'm really curious about the, the differences <laughs> in those experiences, um, as well as any advice you might give to our listeners who are considering either of those situations. What, what should they be looking out for? Yeah, um, in both 
situations, I mean, the retrofit was still pretty substantial and basically only the superstructure remained on, um, you know, so not much of it was left behind. And when you get into these big projects, you know, obviously the, the financial equation for me is a little bit different because we're doing research and we don't have to, you know, basically have a revenue stream from produce um, in order for the business to be viable. My economics but, are a little bit... But yeah. I could see that being a pro oricon potentially, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It, you know, you're, you're walking this line of designing in flexibility, which basically equals complexity and cost. And you can design, you know, almost an infinite amount of complexity and flexibility into your greenhouse uh, at cost. And it's like, what's the, what's the appropriate amount of complexity to design in. And obviously that depends on your objectives. And a lot of that's driven by the science, you know, so when it comes to the, to the greenhouse projects, you know, it's interesting because our objectives are so driven by the science. I, I had a lot of people here because I'm inside of a facility that has 60 other greenhouses and there are other players that have opinions about what you should do and not do. And I found a lot of resistance to some of the design features that that I was producing based on the scientific objectives. And, you know, it's really difficult to explain like, look, we're not, this isn't production or, you know, even some of the other work they're doing here is research, but it's not as um, tightly specified or complex as what we're doing. And that, and that's fine. Again, it's not a value judgment, but I still had to to convince people of, you know, okay, this design element that we're bringing in, like it has a specific function. And at the beginning, it was harder to push back on that. Yeah, I, I basically had somebody come along and say, oh, you're building a greenhouse for a million dollars. Like I can build three of them for 800,000. And I'm like, that's great, but I need to have, you know, over-engineered cooling and I need to have shade curtains, any double wall glazing, and I need to have a mist system uh, to meet the scientific objectives. So. The experience has, you know, given me more confidence in sort of owning the decisions that that I've made moving forward, but also being able to talk through that decision making process and, and consider where other people are coming from um, openly, you know, and that's important too because I'm what I'm not saying is like, oh, I've done this before, I know what needs to be done, and this is the way it's going to be done moving forward. And especially when it comes to considering, again, that that budget complexity spectrum, more technology is not always better. And you need to think about the appropriate use of technology when you're making these design considerations. I mean, I was going to ask you that if, if money was a factor, would you have gone with the three greenhouses for $800,000? Did you look at what that proposal was? Could you have said, oh, yeah, that make that would have made sense if it was something else or no, this is still crap. <laughs> um, no, that's a really good question. And I, I would be more critical. This ties into what I was saying, but I would be more critical throughout the process. And again, I don't think that the cheaper greenhouses would have suited our objectives necessarily. But, you know, when you're interacting with this whole range of technical salespeople, they, they come at you with their proposals. And I think it's important for anybody involved in this process to really think critically about what is being handed to you and um, ask questions because, you know, their, their job is to sell you a system. And it's not like there's anything malicious behind that, but we need to be critical throughout the process and make sure that we're getting the right thing. What would be your top three questions in, in vetting? If I mean, if you asked, if you had five vendors lined up, what are the same three questions you would ask them? I mean, that's hard because this is kind of a non-answer, but we talked about this a little bit the other day. The, the commissioning process, I, I would want to make sure that that's built into the design considerations from the beginning and it's built into the schedule as a discrete activity and that that's owned by by somebody who doesn't have a stake in selling you a piece of equipment. Um, I think that's one of the biggest take homes, and that that kind of falls a little bit more into project management 
but but knowing that you're going to have support that there's going to be someone there to assist you with the startup and commissioning making sure that I mean, you've given me specific examples before of fans being wired incorrectly. Like if someone had just been on site, right, then they would um, and and checked how, you know, what direction the fan is blowing, yeah. <laughs> that would have, you know, uh, reduced your pain. Well, yeah, exactly. And that commissioning process needs to reflect the con- design and construction process. So taking that into consideration, it has to be formalized at the beginning of the process as you go through design so that, you know, you come up with a design element. Okay, here's how we're going to validate it down the road. And we know that now, and we know who's going to be responsible for it so that there are no questions for each of these things, because the devil's in the details. I mean, you, you know, you build a greenhouse and there's so many little considerations that have to be made throughout, throughout the whole process. And you have to capture that first, definitely. Was it easier or harder to retrofit the greenhouse than build from scratch? That's a great question. I frankly think that given my set of circumstances, it's easier to build from scratch. You know, I I tried to save a few, like a couple of tanks, for example, to save a little bit of money. And it's like, in the grand scheme of things, it was a trivial amount of money and it's caused more headaches to try and adapt this old equipment. And it's definitely in my situation, it would have been easier to just go all out and rebuild it all. You know, and we have to pour, I mean, we're pouring concrete floors because we have to contain all of our water for regulatory reasons. And it just makes more sense. But the, again, that doesn't necessarily apply to everybody out there and everybody's circumstances are gonna be different. So it's important for people who are considering building a greenhouse to know what their design criteria are and what their goals are. You know, what what I find a lot of times with greenhouse vendors is that, you know, they are selling a turnkey process yep. and they're selling a standard kit and they don't necessarily take into account you know the sunlight conditions the latitude conditions um the end goal whether it's for scientific research or production agriculture i mean just your comment that you know you had someone say well you know we can build three greenhouses for less than this one greenhouse to me that is the perfect example of a a vendor who isn't listening. Yeah, exactly. Well, and and going back to your point about like, what what are the key things to ask? Like it's difficult for me because it's so obvious, but I mean, you hit the nail on the head, like the, the requirements gathering process is step one. And if you don't have this experience firsthand, find somebody who does, you know, you need to understand what the local weather conditions are and the averages throughout the year. And you need to look at your DLI and and that needs to reflect your objectives within the greenhouse. So basically anybody who's trying to sell you a prepackaged kit who doesn't ask those questions, that's that's the red flag right there. Yeah, that, that should be step one for sure. So, you know, in the past, we've talked about automation and controls, and you're a big fan of that. Can can you talk about why that is important to operate a CEA facility, whether it's for production or for science? Like, what's the value of monitoring and controlling, you know, monitoring your conditions, um, all of them, and and the ability to then use that as feedback to then control the equipment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, we're humans and even the most talented grower who doesn't use controls is still operating subjectively. And you can get really good at that at a smaller scale. And I'm not saying that to the, that to discount excellent growers, like you have to have that artistic element and being able to read the conditions, but we are not data-driven creatures and a control system is data driven, obviously. So 
you're never going to do as good of a job if you're like literally manually operating vents and irrigation systems and whatever inside the greenhouse, you're never going to do as good a job as the computer does. And then on top of that, your computer is producing this massive stream of metadata about what's happening in the climate as you grow. And from that, all sorts of wonderful insights can be gleaned about how the greenhouse performs um, relative to outside weather conditions, or if a piece of equipment is failing, like there's so much insight in that data and it, and it takes experience, you know, having a control system doesn't mean that you set some numbers and you walk away. There's still an intensive amount of operation that's necessary. Um, and, it, and, it, and it takes skill to learn how to analyze data too. And that's a whole other subject of sort of data stewardship and analysis. But yeah, you, you have this stream of metadata and, and there's a ton of insight to be, to be found in it. And then just like efficiency. I mean, come on, you're gonna save time and energy inputs by using a control system. And I think that's, yeah, that's critical. You have at your greenhouse a, a separate monitoring system, right? In addition yeah. to the monitoring system tied to the controller, why? Okay, so I, I, I'm swimming in data. I have a ton of data and it, it has this dual nature where it's operational data. So I'm getting you know feedback about the climate and the water chemistry, for example. And we use that to make decisions, um, you know, to adjust the fertilizer injectors or to adjust the vent settings or what have you. But then the flip side of this is all of the data I'm producing is metadata for the science that we're doing. So we are taking these microbes, we're applying them to plants, and we're looking at the plant phenotype to evaluate how well the microbe did what we expect it to do. So the climate metadata is, completely correlated to the plant performance when you're, when you're looking at PAR and temperature, um, humidity. And so all of this, this data that comes out of the computer goes into our data lake here, and it needs to be available for our data science team to look at so that they can correlate micro performance with plant performance relative to the environmental conditions. So Priva, I love Priva, but it's taking one temperature reading in the middle of a greenhouse. Anybody who's worked in a greenhouse knows it's a dynamic environment and there are gradients across the whole thing. And so, you know, my mantra is basically anything that I can't control, I characterize. And so I have a high resolution sensing system that's, you know, the basic temperature, relative humidity, photosynthetically active radiation, set of sensors that's distributed throughout the greenhouse so that I can have a nice high resolution map of what's happening spatially in there. And again, it, it drives what we do operationally and it's super, I mean, it's more than relevant. It's what drives the science that we're doing as well. I mean, for those who might be listening and they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, you're doing this scientific research, you know, that doesn't apply to me. What would you say to them? BS. I mean, we've seen, we've seen what happens when equipment fails in a grow room. And again, some, sometimes these sort of things can be gleaned from the data as it's happening or before it becomes a significant issue. So again, there's this right fit for technology. And I'm not saying that like everybody needs to run out and install a whole bunch of sensors in their grow space for the sake of it. You need to have a plan, but um, there's complexity in these systems throughout space and time. And the only way you're going to understand those trends is by collecting the data. And so I think the value is there for everybody. You just, you need to have a plan and you need to think critically about it, how you're implementing it. I feel like regardless if you're a field farmer, a greenhouse grower, or an indoor farmer, you know, if you're growing cannabis or lettuce or tomatoes, whatever you're growing or microbes that, I mean, you ultimately are a plant scientist. I mean, assuming you are a curious um, individual and yeah. you're like, oh, you know, like, I wonder why our cannabis buds were so huge this time. Yep. Or why did we get powdery mildew this time? Just by asking that question, 
you are being a scientist. And if you don't have the data to help you answer that question, how are you going to know what to do or to avoid the next time? That's exactly right. You know, and the best growers I know have that scientific mindset and that curiosity. And, and it's funny because it seems like there's this prestige attached to the name and I still hesitate to call myself a scientist, but, but I am. And there are lots of growers out there who are. It's not about your degree and, and what experience you have. It's about your curiosity and how you answer questions. And again, the best growers I know are the ones who, who keep asking questions and using data to solve them. Yeah, totally. Okay. Tell us about bonsai. Yeah. How did you get into bonsai? And, and what is it exactly? Yeah. I mean, I feel like everyone has kind of a general idea of what bonsai is, right? But yeah, you So bons her. bonsai is, is basically growing a plant in a container. It's usually a, a woody plant, um, but growing it in a container and managing it for sort of aesthetic purposes. And there's, there's a lot of misconception out there. People think that we're torturing plants and we're we're, you know, dwarfing them intentionally and, and doing all sorts of evil, cruel things to them to make them to look a certain way. You know, and to an extent that might be true, but, <laughs> but you know, you, your objective is like with growing to maintain healthy plants. So, you know, anybody who's out there just chopping off all the roots is killing their plants. But bonsai is, you know, it's a Japanese tradition, it has roots going back into to China further. And it's, it's all about growing plants in a container in a way that evokes an emotion. And part of that is sort of reflecting our landscape in a way. So there's these wonderful traditions in Japan of, of planted aquariums as well, just intricate uh, designs with rocks and plants underwater and they reflect landscapes. And so it's the same with bonsai. We're not trying to duplicate a tree in nature necessarily, but we're trying to evoke an emotion that's sort of reflective of, of something you would see or feel when you're out, out in nature. Um, but you're trying to evoke emotion in yourself or in a human, not in the plant. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Now it's debatable what plants feel, but you know, we- but You are we, creating an emotional bond with your plant. Exactly, yeah. But you know, we're, we're, we are stewards of the plants with a vested interest in their well being. So people have a lot of misconceptions about it. And it starts with, you know, people acquiring a plant they see them, they like the way they look, they buy them, and they don't realize how much work goes into it. And, um, you know, oh, I can just keep this inside, you know, where it doesn't get sunlight and water it, and it'll just be a bonsai ad infinitum. But that's not how it works. It's a, it's a discipline. It's a lifelong practice, like so many things um, from Japanese culture. There's never a point of, like, absolute mastery there's always something more to be learned and you, you commit your life to it. And um, yeah, I know it's, it's absolutely a process and it, it really is mind blowing how much there is to it. If you're an outsider and you, you don't know, I mean, there's a whole set of rules around composition and proportion and color. And it's, it's very similar to other visual arts where you, you have these rules and traditions and you need to understand the rules and traditions in order to be able to break them. You know, so there are people who do different styles that aren't necessarily like purely Japanese style, but you have to sort of pay homage to proportion and, and dimension and, and these other characteristics. And you can still have your own style, but I mean, it's like, it's like painting, like, it, you know, somebody who's an impressionist painter, you can't just like slap some paint on a canvas and, and call that fine art. You have to have appreciation for the discipline and who's come before you and, and exercise that and really understand the rules in order 
to sort of break them down the road. I mean, a lot of what you're saying sounds like what indoor farmers, greenhouse growers are doing on a daily basis in some way in terms of pruning and training plants. Like, like yeah. what do you see are some of the, um, the crossovers between bonsai and yeah, yeah farming? I mean, hands down, the biggest is pruning. And, and really, it's about understanding how plant hormones work within the plant and how your pruning is going to affect the development of the plant further down the road, um, causing it to bud, bud back in other areas, sort of breaking apical dominance. And each species of plant is going to react differently. And of course, there's the environment as well, you know, genetics by environment equals phenotype. Um, so there's a lot of lessons to be learned about pruning and you know obviously if you're pruning a tomato or a cannabis plant it's not necessarily for aesthetic reasons but it's critical to understand the flow of hormones within the plant from the meristems and you know to the roots and vice versa uh, in order to make informed decisions about pruning but say more about the apical meristem what is that i mean the meristem is basically the undifferentiated plant cell tissue and it, it develops at bud sites um, but the the apical meristem is the topmost uh, meristem in the plant and there's this thing called apical dominance and I, I i won't be able to explain this without having a whiteboard but you basically have there's one behind you listen <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have the two two critical plant hormones called auxin and cytokinin Oxin is produced in the top of the plant primarily, and it's transported from the top to the bottom. Cytokinin is produced in the bottom and it's transported from the bottom to the top. So oxin promotes root growth and cytokinin promotes budding. And so with the apical, there's this thing called apical dominance where the, the sort of balance, the gradient of these hormones is such that the apical bud grows strongest relative to all the other buds on the plant because of the, the equilibrium of the hormones. And when you cut that, that apical bud, you're breaking apical dominance and thereby allowing uh, lower subordinate buds to become the primary buds um, in terms of that oxen balance. So rather than the plant growing upwards and vertically, you're training it I guess, in a way to grow laterally and outward. Yeah, exactly. So you, you cut that apical bud and you're going to force the, the laterals to grow out more precisely. So are bonsai trees mini trees or are they like actual like normal trees? I mean, there's nothing special about the genetics necessarily. We're, we're, there are plants that are more conducive to bonsai um than others but you know i'm taking like a japanese black pine which in the field would grow to you know 100 feet tall and i'm growing that in a pot and yeah in a way i am sort of miniaturizing that by the way i i keep it in that pot and by the way i prune the branches and the roots so there's that miniaturization component but again there's there's this whole set of rules around proportion and design where you're trying to evoke uh, a sense of age with that tree. That's really one of the primary objectives is to make this small tree appear like an aged tree in the wild, almost as if it's like, you know, far away at a distance from you. And so there are, there are visual cues like the, the thickness of the trunk and the taper of the trunk and the amount of trunk that's visible proportionate to the branches covering it and the length of the branches relative to the height of the tree and sort of manipulating all of these proportions to make it look like it's as aged as possible is really the main objective. That's really interesting. Do you actually trim the roots or just by binding it in the pot are the roots shortened? Uh, both. So, so yeah, you absolutely do have to trim the, the roots when you're repotting, but it, you know, it's a delicate balance because some, some trees are much more sensitive to that. 
and you can only trim a, a little bit of the root mass at one time. So you'll trim it and repot it. And then the next year you'll trim a little bit more or others are super sensitive or not sensitive and you can just whack them everything off and it'll reroot just fine. Um, but yeah, you have to manage the roots. Absolutely. Interesting. So do you consider, you, you touched on this a tiny bit earlier in our conversation, but do you consider the industry of, of CEA um, to be more competitive or collaborative? And I'm almost even curious about the insights into the research that's done using CEA. I mean, obviously Bayer is a big company. I mean, do you know what's going on in other Bayer? You know, can you apply anything or learn anything from what other people are doing? I have no idea what's happening out there, even within this company. I mean, granted, we're not technically a part of Bayer. We're a, a separate organization, but you know, you talk about secrecy in the CEA industry. I mean, to, to answer your question, I think it's primarily competitive. Um, I think it's changing versus collaborative, but especially within the plant science research side of things, it's extremely secretive when you're talking about these large breeding or chemical companies. And I would argue that with some of the scientific research, some of the secrecy makes a little bit more sense because you have actual intellectual property that you're trying to, to preserve. Um, oftentimes though, it's you know genetics and somebody would have to come actually steal genetic material in order for that to get out there versus something saved in your Google Drive. But you know, I, I think it gets a little bit muddier when you talk about the production side of CEA. You know, a lot of companies and growers are really locked down with all aspects of their operation. And I think that there are basic aspects of good horticultural practices that aren't so much intellectual property. And some of it comes from people who have less experience who are new to the industry and think that some fertilizer recipe or temperature setting is some, you know, secret sauce. And there might be aspects of that relative to what exactly you're trying to do. But generally speaking, you know, this stuff's the bread and butter of good horticulture. And I think that, I think there's more to be gained by being collaborative with this basic stuff than there is by being sort of secretive about it. I think the industry is changing. I mean, the last few years, it's been really just amazing to see the growth, uh, the maturity of the industry come around. And, you know, like the work that you're doing sort of across companies um, is really interesting because, you, you know, it's sort of outside of the silos of these individual companies. And I want to see more of that happening in the industry, um, especially when we start talking about these life cycle analyses and collecting data about inputs and outputs, you know, this is the area where we really need to come together because the future regulatory landscape is dependent on us doing that. Yeah. You know, just a little bit on that note, we have either walked away from projects or haven't been uh, invited to work on projects with some most mostly vertical farming companies because the NDA was way too restrictive mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, they didn't want to work with us because I, maybe we were helping them with their competition or they were afraid we were going to tell their competition what they were doing or because they're embarrassed that they haven't mm -hmm. figured mm -hmm. something out. I, yep. I'm pretty sure it's all of the above in yep. different cases, you know, but what I've told some people, I'm like, look, if you're concerned about your nutrient recipes, we don't need to know that. We don't care. You don't want to tell us what kind of lights you're using or what special like dimming spectrum, whatever, like we don't care. Just tell us what the watt heat output is, you know? Oh, you have this different racking, you know, this unique racking system. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when it comes to HVAC, every, you know, whether you're designing a commercial building, a hospital, a school, a home, 
a vertical farm. Honestly, every solution is unique because we have to take into account all your unique criteria and and goals um, and climate and plant and, you know, building structure. It doesn't even matter that, you know, applying those unilaterally is never going to happen. So what you're going to get is something that's unique. Also, it's not, you know, we're, we're not inventing a machine. Those machines exist out there. We might just be helping you find the best machine that already exists. Or, you know, we've worked on about 150 projects. And when it comes to climate management, there's not a lot of IP. When yeah, it comes to climate it. management, there's a lot more problems than there are solutions. And I wish that people would trust us and trust themselves, honestly, to help solve these problems as an individual company or for, you know, the greater good of the industry. Because everybody has the same challenge, humidity yeah. and airflow. Bottom Absolutely. Line. Absolutely. So let's get together and solve it together. Exactly. You know, I, Help us help you. Exactly. You know, and I, I want to be sensitive to, to, to people and, and not sort of say it like, you know, oh, you know, people are defensive of, of their thing and they shouldn't be in their, I don't know, being a bad person because of it. But it's kind of a scarcity mindset, you know, like get over. <laughs> Maybe I won't say that, but. <laughs> but edit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, but, but seriously, if we are making claims that we are going to solve these really big challenges that are right around the corner, if not here already, when it comes to land use, when it comes to water use, when it comes to climate change and food security and resiliency and all these things, time is of the essence, people. Absolutely. And the more we can work together, the faster we can actually solve these problems that we're saying we're solving. Otherwise, it's going to be 50 years in the future and we're not going to have any food. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's so right. I think I think the the trend is going in the right direction and it's just going to take more people coming to realize this and more people doing doing the good work like you're doing and and connecting all these pieces together. Yeah. So, you know, what is exciting to you about the future of CEA? I mean, absolutely what we're talking about here, like the 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 collaboration aspect, uh, I want to see that unfold more. It's just fantastic seeing ma- the maturity of the industry where, you know, we've come so far in the last few decades and it seems to be accelerating even more as time goes by. But, you know, we're seeing we're seeing companies who have their ducks in a row, who have this process excellence worked out, rise to the top. Um, you know, there's going to be shakeouts uh, like in any industry. That's a given. But um, the people who who have everything together rising to the top, and I think that that's fantastic. The, the continued development of technology is something that I'm passionate about. And, you know, I can't wait to see what, what new things are around the corner and really how some of the, the new technology that's in front of us now can be applied in, a, in an effective way, you know, and that what that really comes down to is like the appropriate use of technology. People get excited about tech and want to throw things in for the sake of it. And, and it's not always the answer. And we have to think critically when we're applying technology to these problems. But yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see where that goes. New crops in CEA, you know, that's kind of a big one. Like we, we know what works currently. And I know that there are some people, it was cool listening to you talk to um, Joe, Joe Schwartz with Amhydro and, you know, growing woofa sponges and, and all these different crops in his greenhouse. And, you know, maybe we can't grow peach trees in a, in a greenhouse quite yet the way it's uh, been claimed by some companies, but um, there's definitely more we can do than leafy greens and strawberries. And I want to see that, that boundary get pushed out further. I totally agree. Um, economic incentives, you know, and, and this sort of fits into the regulatory framework. I want to see companies continue to get involved in the re- regulatory landscape. 
you know, because there, there are decisions that are going to be made that, that affect production downstream. And the more we get involved in that process, the more of a say we're going to have. And I think it's important to realize that. I know not everybody has an appetite for getting involved in regulation, but like it or not, it's an important aspect of this industry. As related to, to what I said about, you know, co collaborative work within the sort of life cycle analyses, continuing to see data-driven decisions being made by companies um, and really arriving in a world where we are making decisions and we are moving forward based off of data and, you know, not just promises from the marketing department or hopes and dreams and expectations, but, you know, more data-driven reality. Yeah. So last question, what do plants crave? Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get touchy feely on you, but you you know I said this earlier when um, Dana in interviewed me after your workshop, but plants crave empathy and gratitude, and you know first of all on sort of an obvious technical level, we've we've taken the care of these organisms, the the responsibility of that into into our realm and we need to make sure that we are tending to them appropriately. And, you know, it's easy, I'm sitting here talking about technology and complexity and all that, but at the end of the day, being a good grower means being able to focus on the basics and to give it attention. And that's not easy. It's not easy. It's easy to be distracted by all the other fires that you need to put out. And it takes a concerted effort to spend time with your plants on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're irrigating or you're scouting for pests or you're managing fertilizers, but making sure that you are doing the basics and managing your horticulture to the best of your ability is number one. And, and you know, I say empathy and gratitude kind of jokingly, but I mean it, you know, you really have to spend the time and take a step back and, and think about your mindset and how that reflects on your actions with your plants. And, and in a way that kind of reflects back to this whole bonsai thing. You know, when you're talking about mastery, there are so many things in life that involve this idea of mastery. And really there's never a point where you absolutely nail it, where there's some end goal where you've just completely mastered it. There's always another level of advancement and when you realize that you're better able to embody a growth mindset um, and, and that applies to, to all of our pursuits as humans, you know, whether it's bonsai or indoor ag or, you know, what have you. So I think um, being a better human is going to be good for your crop and good for you and good for the world. Being a better human equates to growing better plants. Heck yeah. I like it. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> Makes sense to me. I mean, we are all alive. Um, so we should treat other living things. Um, I don't know. Can we apply the golden rule? The the green rule um, <laughs> in this case? Exactly. Uh, treat plants as you'd want plants to treat you. <laughs> exactly. That's it. <laughs> drop the mic right there. Mic drop. <laughs> All right. Well, we're not quite done. So I have some rapid fire questions for you. Okay. okay. So quick answer, maybe a one or two sentence following that. All right. Are plants introverts or extroverts? Well, that depends on the plant. I mean, just like humans, we're, we're, a, we're a complex set of creatures. So it depends on the plant. Inter just out of curiosity, do you have an example of each? Maybe you don't. Uh, no, uh, aspen trees, they are, well, no, that's complicated because it's all one organism. Yeah. I was going to say they're extroverts because they're all, you know, communing together. Mm, I like that. They're a big yeah. family. Yeah. Can CEA help yeah. feed the world? <laughs> Absolutely. And not only can it, it's going to be a critical piece of the puzzle uh, to solving these complex problems. I don't think it can alone but it's going to be an important uh, tool in the quiver. Yeah. What's the worst advice you've ever gotten about growing plants? Oh, geez. 
I don't know, putting crystals in the water. <laughs> I guess that's maybe not the worst, and unless you're putting some mineral in there that's going to actually cause problems, it's probably pretty harmless. Interesting. Okay, I like that. What's the best advice you've gotten? <laughs> that one's harder. I love yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's way harder. That's way harder. <laughs> you know, people, irrigation is hard, and people love to overwater. You really, it, it takes, it takes a, little, a bit of effort to pull back and to, to not overwater. Um, so making sure that you're hitting that Goldilocks zone and um, letting the soil dry down just enough to get to right to the edge of drought stress, that, that's, that's a key one. Nice, nice. We hear a lot about irrigation on this podcast um, yeah. in terms of don't overwater, basically, is the advice that's given. Yeah. Um, all right. If you could apply bonsai to any horticultural crop, what would it be and why? All right. I've got a peach tree in my collection, actually. And why? Because it produces really cute little peaches. So imagine having. Does it really? A, absolutely. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, no, there's a whole scene of, you know, persimmon trees and sometimes people will have this cute little tree and it'll have one persimmon on it. It's hilarious. I had no idea that fruit trees were even used. I guess they're woody trees. Absolutely. But then the f they actually will produce fruit? Absolutely. Because I guess you're still managing, balancing the hormones that's associated with that and they're still going through daylight cycles. So... Wait, so if you're growing that in a pot, I mean, fruit trees are so different than horticulture. So do, it needs to have like a dormancy, it would have a dormancy period? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my trees are all grown outside. So it's it's it would be like a, a peach tree growing in Davis in the Sacramento Valley year round. So it's getting its chill period. As long as it's getting enough sunlight and nutrients and the right temperature conditions, it's it's happy. Okay, so how do those fruits taste? That's a different issue. <laughs> <laughs> Are they fuzzy? Do they have fuzzy skin? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Super well, how cute. big is the pit? <laughs> I mean, it's like most of the fruit, you know. There's The root mass on these trees <laughs> is so small. It's, it's more of an aesthetic thing. Oh, my God. Can, could you plant that pit and grow a... a, a a peach tree from it do you think yeah if you i i think it needs to be stratified it, it, it can be hard to get some of these seeds to germinate but sure no why not interesting so in um space travel could we they take some like bonsai fruit trees with them and then plant them those seeds to i mean i don't know why you would do that not just take the seeds with you but you know i mean well maybe because if you're trying to create the illusion of a full-grown tree, there could be like some serious psychological benefits to- Heck yeah, no, heck yeah. I mean, people focus on, you know, oh, does this produce food or not? But art is really important for us. We need to see beauty, you know, it's integral to the human experience. And I think it, it's, it's not something to be discounted. Interesting. All right, well, I learned a lot today. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for for spending uh, this afternoon with me. I really appreciate it, Ian. That was an absolute blast, Nadia. Thank you so much for making this happen. Absolutely. I don't think it's going to be 105 degrees out today, so it still gets hot in the greenhouse when it's hot outside. Absolutely. It's the time of year we get we get work done, and we're out by 11. Nice. Nice. Well, thanks again, and uh, we will talk soon. Sounds good, Nadia. Have a good All one. Right. Thanks, Ian.